Okay, so how is everyone today? <laughs> Getting thin. Well, so last time we uh, ended the discussion about differentials. So now we need to begin a new discussion about 9.6. So we're in a new section, section 9.6, and it is called, I disagree with the title given in the textbook, uh, so I'll call it Iterated Integrals and Double Integrals. So, <laughs> I've read what the author has to say about this topic, and I can't tell if the author is confused or very clumsily trying to hide something, uh, but these are not the same. And the author seems to be implying that they are. Okay, but I think, I think trying to say that they're the same thing is a pathway to confusion. So we're gonna very carefully um, keep, keep these things uh, separated. Okay, so to, uh, to bring about the topic, let's do an example. I wanna ask, what would you do if I asked you right now to, to do the following. Integral one to two, and then five x cubed y to four, uh, minus six x squared y, plus two dy. So what would you do if, if we had to do this right now? Yeah, we'd need to do an antiderivative. And specifically, well, we'd want to use the fundamental theorem so that in, in doing so we'd want to use a antiderivative, and we'd be anti-differentiating with respect to y. Uh, because why would we be differentiating, anti-differentiating with respect to y? Because it says dy. Okay. If it said dx, we'd be doing it with respect to x. Okay. So we're doing some action with respect to y. What are we supposed to be doing with those x's? and we're gonna to have to treat them as constants. Somehow, they don't depend on y, so we'll just treat them as constants. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna proceed treating x as constant. Okay, well. Uh, so what is the antiderivative of 5x cubed y to 4 with respect to y? <coughs> Just that one term. 5x cubed y Not quite, the, the antiderivative. So, so 5x cubed and then I, I agree and then the 5x cubed is just hanging out and doing nothing interesting why, why, is, that, why is that? I haven't finished writing but, but I claim that the 5x cubed is doing nothing 
because it's a constant, right? So then this would be y to 5 over 5. And I agree that the 5s would cancel. OK, then minus. What is the antiderivative of 6x squared y with respect to y? Mm -hmm. 6x squared, y squared over 2. And I agree that there'd be some little bit of cancellation. What is the antiderivative of 2? Two? 2y. Two and then we'll do this for the, for the fundamental theorem. We'll go from 1 to 2. Now I'll make some simplification. Uh, the fives will cancel there, so we get x cubed y to 5, and then minus 3x squared y squared, and then plus 2y, and I'll go from 1 to 2. Now, there's strictly speaking, there's nothing wrong with what I've written, but what I want to get, what I want to sort of make the point is that the way I've written it sort of is a little bit of bad hygiene. Uh, specifically, if you were in a hurry, or or even worse, if I just if I just gave you that with no other context, that is a confusing instruction. What's confusing about this instruction if you have no other context with it? Right. Is that, is that from when x's go from 1 to 2, or is that when y's go from 1 to 2? So does everybody see that there's a, there's a, bit, of a bit of an issue there? So in order to overcome that, rather, I need you to write this in a different way. x cubed y to 5 <coughs> minus 3x squared y squared plus 2y. And then to make it clear, in, in this kind of context, we'll write y is 1 to y is 2. And observe that this line is no longer ambiguous. It can mean, it can mean only one thing. OK, so then let's do that. Let's plug in the, those values. So that would be uh, 2 to 5 is 32. So that would be 32 x cubed and then minus y uh, 2 squared is 4 times 3 is 12, so 12 uh, x squared, and then plus 4, minus, now plug in 1, x cubed uh, minus 3x squared plus 2, and then simplify a little bit, and we get what? Uh, 31 x cubed, negative 12 plus 3 is 9, negative 9, x squared, and then 4 minus 2 is 2. OK, interesting. Any question about this? OK, what if, what if you are given the following prompt? <coughs> integral 0 to 3, integral 1 to 2, 5 x cubed y to 4 minus 6 x squared y plus 2 dy dx. Now what? <laughs> OK, so 
I'd like to point out, in case you weren't paying close attention, that, uh, well, if I cover that up and that up, then it's the same question as the previous page, right? It's the same question as the previous page. So, uh, in order to do this, in order to do this, we'll, we'll do it, uh, like, like she said, in the opposite order of an onion, right? Which is to say, the way, you, the way you deal with an onion is from the outside in, but to deal with this, uh, we're going to go from the inside out. And I'll write this in a more verbose way. So x is 0, x is 3. y is 1, y is 2, d, x. So these bits, this, is always paired on the outside with this one, just like parentheses are paired, right? This open square parentheses is paired with this closed square parentheses. And this begin integral is always paired with its end integral, the differential part. So they come in pairs. So this part is the part talking about y's. And this part is the part talking about x's. Okay. Well, conveniently enough, conveniently enough, uh, we did this on the previous page. So I'm just going to copy that in. <coughs> the thing in square parentheses. thirty one x cubed minus nine x squared plus two dx. That's just copying the result from the previous page. So what I'd like for you to observe is that to answer the current question, you know this this work was from the previous page. So that means that to answer this question, you had to do one integral. And now, well, now we're going to do another one, one after the other. And because, because that's the, the way that you carry out this procedure, you do one integral followed by another, this procedure is called an iterated integral. Okay, so let's do it real quick. And this, this integral that remains on the page is one that you could have done weeks and weeks ago now. Okay, well, uh, the first term would give us what? 31 over 4 x to 4 uh, minus 3 x cubed and then plus 2 x. And then we're going to do this from 0 to 3. Okay, so then we'll do this quickly. Uh, it's nice that one of the evaluation points is zero. So that'd be, um, what? 31 over four, and then times three to four, well that's 81, and then minus th uh, three times 27, that's 81, and then plus six minus zero, and then if you do a bunch of boring arithmetic, you'll eventually come to 2211 two, two, over 4. Okay, interesting. 
one integral after another. Any question about this one? Okay, let's try another. So the outside one is one to two, the inside one is three to five. <coughs> And then what we're integrating is 6xy squared plus 12x squared y. Plus 4y. D x dy. So, one thing I'd like for you to observe in comparison to the previous example is that notice the previous example was dy dx. So in the previous example that meant that we're dealing with the y's first and after we're done dealing with the y's we deal with the x's and that the opposite is true in the current example. We're going to deal with the x's first and when we're completely finished dealing with the x's then we're going to deal with the y's. Okay. <clears throat> so, so what is the antiderivative of all this stuff with respect to x? How about the first term? Three x squared y squared. Because six y squared is a constant with respect to x. That's to say all the stuff that I, in the first term there, the only thing that is, that's not constant is that x. The antiderivative of x is x squared over two but then it has this constant with it, 6y squared, so 3x squared y squared. Okay, plus, what's the antiderivative of this term with respect to x? Very good, 4x cubed y. And then plus, what is the antiderivative of 4y with respect to x. That's, the, that's its derivative for xy. Okay, so let's think about that for a moment. What is the, with respect to x, what is the antiderivative of 5? Five? 5x. Five what is the antiderivative of 8? Eight? 8x, eight because 8 is constant. How about what's the antiderivative of pi? Pi x, because pi is constant. So what is the antiderivative of 4y? Right, correct, 4y x, which, yeah, I'm going to write it down as 4xy. Okay. Any question getting to this part? Okay, so let's do that. So if we plug in x is 5 into there, mm -hmm. that's 25 times 3 is 75. So 75y squared plus, plugging in 5 there, that's 125 times 4 is 500. Plugging in 5 there, that's 20. 
So that's what you get when you plug in 5. Now we'll plug in 3. 27. Uh, 108. 12. Okay, then now just a step of algebra here. <clears throat> 75 minus 27 is 55 minus 7 is 48. Y squared. 520 minus 120. that much and then now here we're at an integral that you could have been given weeks and weeks and weeks ago but notice we just got finished with the X's and now that we're finished with the X's now the work with the Y's commences okay well that'd be uh, watch 16 <coughs> Y cubed plus 200 y squared, and then this from, from 1 to 2. And then there'd be some boring arithmetic that I'll just omit, because you can take care of that yourself. 712. Interesting. Any question about this? So one thing I'd like for you to observe is that, you know, in this exercise we did an integral involving x's and then that was immediately followed by an integral involving y's. So this is called an iterated integral. Please do understand that if you, if you can do it twice, then you can do it arbitrarily many times, right? We could do an integral with respect to a, followed by one with respect to b, followed by one with respect to c, and we could exhaust the whole alphabet. In, in, in principle. Okay. <clears throat> so, the question I want to address now is, well, what is the geometry? What, what, what geometric thing is occurring here? <clears throat> because presently, <clears throat> presently this has just been, you know, no pictures at all have been drawn. What does this have to do with anything? Okay. So in order to answer the question, what is the geometry of, of this procedure that we're doing, I need you to remind me. Well, what, what is the geometry of, of just a regular old int integral? Forget iterative integrals, just imagine we're doing just one of them. What, what geometric thing is happening there? Area. It's the area under a curve, right? When you do just one of them. So what is it what is it what does it mean to be doing two of them one after another? Okay. So to answer that question. This is a remark about the geometry. of iterated integrals. Okay. <clears throat> but before we do that, I need one minor remark. And it is the following. Suppose you take uh, say, a rectangle. So this, this rectangle, we're seeing it in perspective. And what I want you to imagine is that now I make it, 
Now I make it go straight up. So it will be just like me taking this sheet of paper right here, if you like, holding it right here, and then sweeping it straight up. The action of taking this rectangle and sweeping it straight up sweeps out a volume. And that volume is so common that it has its own name. What's the name for that volume I'm sweeping out? The shape. Now you might call it a box, right? So if I take a rectangular base and then I sweep it straight up, that sweeps out a box. Similarly, if I take a circle like this one and I hold it, say, towards you and then I sweep it towards you like this, that also sweeps out a shape. What's its shape? What's, what's its name? Cylinder, right? That's a cylinder. So if you take this and you sweep it up, and if this um, is the, say, if this is x, and uh, no, we don't want to make that one x. We'll call this one length, and this one width, and this one height then what is the, the volume of the swept out shape? This has volume, length times width times height. What if instead of taking a rectangle, instead of taking a rectangle, what if we take a circle viewed in perspective? and it has radius r, and we do the same thing that we sweep it straight up to make a cylinder. Well, what's the volume of the resulting cylinder? Pi r squared h. What I want you to see that the, these both have something in common. Both, both of these formulas have something in common. It is always going to be the area of the base multiplied by the height it was that it swept out. The area of the base multiplied by the height that it swept out. So if you take any old shape, any old shape at all, that you're viewing in perspective, and if it has area, if, if this has area given by A, and if you take it and you sweep it up a distance of H, so that you make some weird looking thing, then what's the volume of the resulting, of the resulting uh, object? It'll be A times H. Okay. Base times height. Base times height. Base times height. It's always this way. Good. Now that we have that settled, I'll say let uh, f of x and y be defined on a less or equal to x less or equal to b and c less or equal to y less or equal to m. <laughs> and if it comes as a surprise that I didn't say d, well, the reason why I'm not saying d is because d is the most overused letter in mathematics. And there's going to be d's all over the place, and I didn't need another one. So we're going to use m. OK. <clears throat> so 
let's consider uh, the following. Consider <coughs> the iterated integral from y is c to y is m, x is a, x is b, f of x and y, dx dy. So we've done a few examples of this. What, what kind of thing comes first? What, 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 which variable do you have to deal with first is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, you've got to deal with the, with the x's first, because that's the inside one. You, then uh, after that's finished, you deal with the y's. But what, while you're dealing with the x's, what are you doing with the y's? You have to treat them in a certain way. You treat them as constant, right? So to do this, you deal with x first, And your treat, and while you're doing that, you're treating y as constant. Okay, well, let's let's see what that what that implies in a picture. So the output axis is always going up, and then now you've got to remind me, which one is which? Okay, and then Y is over here. So now, here's my attempt to try to remind you. Right? So I always try and draw the axis in this configuration, and that kind of helps because then sometimes students can say, well, I just always remember it's just so. But why? <laughs> Why is it just so? Why is it got why does the why is the x simply must be here? Alternatively, I could ask if this one were z, which one would be x? Or if this one were z, which one would be x? So so in the, in this picture we're saying this one is z. Why must it be the case that this one is x? Okay, it comes down to in the end a convention. It's just like it's just like when you're drawing a number line, why do we why do we take the convention that moving to the right is increasing? Well, in a, in a di on a different planet, or in a different, in a different uh, stellar system, they might draw lines that are increasing to the left. And there'd be nothing wrong about that. The only thing is we have to always, to communicate effectively, we all need to have the same agreement, <laughs> right? Just like there's actually nothing at all special about driving on the, on the right side of the road. If, if, we, if we were to make the choice now, but the choice is already made, <laughs> so we're all going to drive on the right, <laughs> on the way home. The right-hand rule is how you make this choice. So what you do is you, you put your fingers in the direction, so x is coming out of the page. So you put, you put your fingers in the direction of the first variable, your, your right-hand fingers. And they should be able to curl to the second variable, first variable to second first to second, and when they curl from first, from x to y, your thumb should be pointing in the output direction. <coughs> and that, that, that's with your right hand. So this convention is called the right hand rule. If this were z, then which one would have to be x? If this one were z? The top one, because it would be x to y. If this one were z? can hardly do it. If this one were z, <laughs> this one would be x, x to y. 
Okay, good. So let's draw the picture. So A to B. So what this picture means, what, what this language means and what this picture means is that we're talking about a function that's defined anywhere <coughs> in that rectangle. So that, that point right there is a valid input, but the, this point over here is not a valid input. So now I'm going to draw my stereotypical surface. which I do by just taking these fence posts up more or less arbitrary amount and then just connecting all of the ones with wavy lines. Okay, nice surface there. <clears throat> so what I want you to imagine is that we're dealing with the x's first and we're treating y's as a constant. However, because of the conditions, we, we don't need to treat, what, what, is the, what is the maximum possible range of all the y's? Of all the possible y values? From c to m, right? We don't need to consider any y values that are anywhere else. <coughs> so we don't need to consider y values that are way over here because that's too big, or y values that are way over here because that's too small. Just, just between C and M. So let's say that we pick a particular Y value. Say like this Y value. That'll be our favorite Y for the moment. So here, I'm going to take that point and that point right there, so the, those two points right there, and I'm going to take them up to the surface. <clears throat> okay, then this whole input right here Suppose that I take that whole input and I go all the way up to the surface and put dots, dot, 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 dot on the surface. Then you would see something like this. Okay. Now I want to pick out that flat sheet right there. So I'm going to shade it so that it might be a little easier to see. <coughs> that green surface that's in there. You can imagine, if, for the moment, if you like, that this was like a solid block of wood, and then we cut it with a green knife right there, and then now you can pull it apart, and that's what you would see. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, if you like, pick up the whole diagram, pick it up, so that here's x, uh, here's Z and X, and I'm going to turn it so that we're looking at Z and X. So I'm going to, it's like I'm picking it up, I'm keeping the Z pointing up, but I'm turning the X axis so that the X axis turns to be pointing that way.
And when that happens, uh, and we're just looking at that green sheet, it would look something like this. Just that one piece, so pick it up and turn it. There it is. Okay. <clears throat> so this shape right here, this is the kind of shape that we can find with an integral, right? With an integral. Mm -hmm. Specifically, what this is, the formula for, for, for this is, the integral from x is a to x is b of f of x and y dx, treating y as a constant. Now what I want you to imagine is that this y that we were formerly treating as constant, now I want you to imagine that I can grab it and move it around. So this, this y back here, I could grab it and pull it over to the side, and what you would see is you'd see this, this green sheet moving around inside of the surface. So, so I could take it and move it back and forth. And you'd see this one moving around a little bit to compensate. <clears throat> okay, so is everybody okay with the picture so far? So what I'm saying is now I'm going to take this, so specifically what I'm going to do, is I'm going to take this line and I'm going to move it over just a little bit to the side. And now to try to keep my pictures from getting too confusing, I'm going to draw another one, maybe on the next page. That's the only thing that's, one of the things that's tedious about this is having to draw these pictures so many times. So A and B. So we had our favorite Y here. And then we're going to move this just a little bit to the right. But now, when we move it to the right, when we move it to the right, we're going to keep uh, 
we're going to make it to where these, these two points, this whole green line, does not move. It doesn't move. It's just going to, it's like the whole panel is just going to sweep to the right. Okay, so we're ignoring all the red now. This panel is going to sweep to the right. When it does that, we're going to get a shape, it looks like. Okay, so it's, it's swept out. And what I'm talking about is this whole solid looking object. So it's kind of hard to see, so let me try and make an, an explanation. It is like this is one big loaf of bread, and that is one slice of the loaf of bread. This is a slice of bread. So I have a question for you. What is the volume? What is the volume of that slice of bread? Let's think about it. So suppose that this distance right here that we move to the right, suppose that distance were delta y. Suppose that distance were delta y. Delta y because it's moving in the y direction. What's the volume of that bread slice? So I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with the remark at the top of the previous page. Well, is the area of this green face because it's the green thing that's moving, and then I'm dragging it this way, multiplied by how far I, it, it, we had to drag it, right? <coughs> so that's the distance that, that it was dragged, delta y. So the volume of that, the volume of that shape is integral from a to b f of x and y dx that's the area of the green part and then multiplied by delta y that's the area of that bit so now i want you to imagine the following imagine that we wanted to set ourselves to calculating the area the volume under this <coughs> red surface, if we wanted to find the volume of that. Well, we could do it in the following way. We could say, ah, let's consider this to be a loaf of bread. And then we can cut it into, say, eight slices. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight slices. And then we could find the area of each slice using integrals that, you, that we already know. And once we fought, found the area of the slice to find the vo to uh, the area of the face of a slice to find the volume of the slice, we just multiply by delta y, and then that would give us the volume of of eight slices, and that would give an, give us an estimate for the for the volume under the surface. But how could we get a better estimate if if using eight slices wasn't a very good estimate? 
How about a how about a hundred slices? And and then if a, if a hundred slices wasn't wasn't a good estimate, well maybe you could use a hundred million slices. But since this is a calculus <coughs> class, well let's just use let's just use Gesundheit. <coughs> let's use infinitely many slices. So we're we're going to take this shape and we're going to cut it into infinitely many infinitesimal bread slices and find all of their volumes. <coughs> so the sum of all slices would be the sum Supposing we cut it into n slices uh, from i is 1 to n. That's the sum of all the slices. And then to get the exact answer, you compute the limit. The limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from i is 1 to n of the integral from a to b of f of x, y, i, uh, dx. Oh, look, I left off a dx up there, too. dx delta y, dx delta y. So this is the exact answer. But the way that you write that compactly is the integral from C to M, integral from A to B, f of x, y, dx, dy. So, so what is the geometric interpretation of iterated integral? It is volume under a surface. That's the answer. So just in the same kind of way that the geometric interpretation of integral is area under a curve, the geometric interpretation of iterated integral is volume under a surface. And it is like, it is like cutting a loaf of bread into slices and then and then finding the volumes of the individual slices okay so let's try and test your conceptual understanding here this picture right here corresponds to this iterated integral dx dy what we, we've done the other order. We did dy dx. What does that have to do with the picture? Or alternatively, <laughs> how does the picture change if we were doing dy dx instead of dx dy? It's not that. I, th I think you're on to it. I think you're on to it. How would, how would this picture change if, if, we, if we were doing dy dx instead of dx dy? I'm not sure I follow. What would be flipped? These bread slices, right? So, so 
if you switch the order of integration, th this dx dy is like cutting it into bread slices going this way. Switching the order of integration dy dx is like cutting it in bread slices like this, the other way, so that the faces that the, 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 the bread slices would be facing us if we were doing it in the other direction. Okay, so I so so let's let's think about this. Do do you suppose that it should matter? What if, what if I what if I put the request to you? I gave you a physical object, and said, I want you to estimate its volume by cutting it into bread slices. Do you think that your the answer to your question would depend on if you cut them this way? or that way, would it matter? If you did it, if you did it in, in the limit, would it matter? <clears throat> Alternatively, suppose that I gave you a loaf of bread and I said, I gave each of you a loaf of bread and I said, oh, I said to each of you, I want you to Cut, cut it into bread slices. And then some of you cut it like this, and others of you cut it like that. Would any of y'all have more bread than, than anyone else? No, you'd all have to have the same amount of bread, right? I gave, I gave you a loaf, I gave you just the same loaf, same, otherwise exactly the same loaf. It doesn't matter how you cut it, it's still gotta be the same volume. Okay, good, so any question about this? <coughs> so that's what iterated integral means. It means finding the volume under a surface by cutting that volume into slices. Okay, well. Now there's even one, more, one other thing that we have to deal with, an abstract thing. So now this is called a double integral. So the previous thing, the previous things that we've been dealing with, bread slices the one way, bread slices the other way, those are called iterated integrals. So here we're talking about a, a, a different thing. It is called a double integral. Okay, so here it is. Let, let f of x and y be defined on this rectangle. So now I'm going to draw a picture and it's going to look almost just like the other one at first. Okay, so again with this stereotypical surface, Now we're going to be interested, again, in the volume that is under this surface. 
But now we're going to attack the problem in, in a different way. So the previous two attacks were, oh, we can cut it in bread slices like that, or we can cut it into bread slices like that. And that corresponds to the two different iterated integrals. Now we're going to attack the problem in the following way. We're going to say, OK, we're going to, so this is the domain. We're going to cut the, uh, this rectangle into sub-rectangles. We're going to make the rect even, even smaller rectangles. So I'll, I'll cut the x's into four pieces. I'll cut the y's into four pieces. So now you can see the domain uh, has been cut into 16 pieces, right? Because I, I happen to have drawn it four by four. OK. <coughs> So now, um, let's consider one specific one of those sub-rectangles. Sub let's consider uh, this sub-rectangle right here. So there's a, there's a particular one. Okay. So let's say that in the x direction, in the x direction, these subdivisions have size delta x. And in the y direction, these uh, subdivisions have size delta y. So what's the area of that, of that singled out rectangle then? Its area is, well, delta x times delta y. OK. So now, <clears throat> let's call this point right here, so that point that's right there, uh, I'm going to refer to it as xi yj. So that point, it's right there. So it can't, it, you have to use two different in indices, i and j, because the x's can move around like this, and the y's can move around like that. You can imagine that little green rectangle moving around uh, in there. So now, from this point, from x, i, y, j, I'm going to go up to the surface. And maybe it, it hits the surface right, right there. So now, uh, what is the height of that point there? What's its height? Well, this is the surface given by f, and that's the input point x, i, y, j. <coughs> so its height is f at x, i, y, j. So now what I want you to imagine is that we consider the shape obtained by taking this green base and pulling it all the way up to the top of the surface, to the top of the surface. And when we, when we do that, we'll sweep out a box, a tall and skinny box, like this.
Okay, so that box could be, it, you know, is like maybe just bare, peeking out of the, the surface just a little bit because it's that back corner, the back corner right there is, is touching the surface. So maybe, maybe it's peeking out of the surface a little bit right there. <clears throat> so what is, my question to you is what is the volume of that box? Volume. So what's the volume of that box? Mm-hmm. The volume of, of any of any box, right? Base times width times height. Okay. So is uh, f of x i y j delta x delta y. So now I drew one 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 box. <coughs> What I want you to imagine is that on top of every single one of the other 15 little sub-rectangles, I also drew a box. Okay. So that now there's boxes over all of them. I have no hope of drawing a comprehensible and understandable drawing of such a thing. So you're going to have to use your imagination a little bit. Okay. Imagine that now we have one of these boxes everywhere. There'd be 16 such boxes. We could, we could add up the volume of the individual boxes to get an estimate for the volume under the surface. <coughs> There'd be 16 of them. That total volume would be given by the sum over all of the y values. So from j is 1 to n and the sum over all the possible x values, i is 1 to n, f of x i, y, j, <coughs> delta x, delta y. So that, that's a fancy way to say, in the picture anyway, all 16 of those boxes. And if 16 boxes wasn't wasn't a good enough es estimate, then we could use, you know, I don't know, <laughs> 17 boxes. But the point in, uh, in calculus is, well, let's just use, let's use infinitely many boxes. Let's go all the way. So the exact answer is you compute the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum from j is 1 to n of the sum <coughs> from i is 1 to n so that's the exact answer but then now we have a cute way to write this right all the greek Symbols become Latin symbols, ha ha. And now you write it like this. So this symbol is called the double integral symbol, side by side integrals. And you write over R, and then f of x and y. I'll write it like this, because that's what your book does, dx dy, where this R is that rectangle, the whole big one, not the little green one that I pointed out. So what I'd like to point out is that at the present time, you have um, in the notes for today, you have three different quantities where, where we're writing something that looks like the integral symbol twice. You've got iterated integral in one order. You've got iterated integral in the other order. 
And then you've got this new thing that we're referring to as double integral. Three different things. <coughs> the geometry associated to them is that one of the iterated integrals is bread slices in the one way. The other iterated integral is bread slices in the other way. And then double integral is like, I don't know, what would you call this? French fries? It's getting, making me hungry. <laughs> like this is a big potato and then you pull it through a thing and make it French fries. This one is double integral. Okay, so then, if you had a potato <laughs> and you cut it with slices like this, or you cut it with slices like that, or you put it through a French fry press and put, made, made French fries like that, should the volume depend, of the volume of the potato depend on how you cut it? No. It's simply got to be the same. It's got to be the same no matter how you cut it. And that is the main result for today. And its, its name is... So after we do this, we can start calculating some more. Its name is Fubini's theorem. <laughs> Let f of x and y be continuous on <clears throat> the region R, which is this rectangle, A less or equal to X less or equal to B, C less or equal to Y less or equal to M. So suppose we have a continuous function. <coughs> then, the one iterated integral the other inter iterated integral. Oops. And the double integral. the same. And since I'm a mathematician, I have to add that, and they all exist. So I'll put, a, I'll put a little asterisk, at least in the conversation here. And that is, um, if f is continuous on that rectangle, then this result is true. That all, uh, all three of those things, the iterated integral in the one way, in the other way, and the double integral are all the same. However, in case you get really excited about math and you want to go off and, you know, think about that a lot, I'll warn you that when you venture too far away from functions that are continuous, you can get objects where all three of those are different. Which is to say, can you imagine a potato that when you cut it in the one way, in the bread slices one way, and then measure, you get a certain volume, and then you, when you cut it in the other way, <laughs> and measure, you get a different volume. And, and then when you cut it into french fries, you get possibly even another volume. The answer is that, well, mathematicians can imagine such a potato. And <laughs> if, 
if you get really into into it, you know, you you too can imagine such a potato, I guess. Okay, but in in physical, in essentially all physical situations mm -hmm. that I'm familiar with, physics and and and, and typical situations, Fubini's theorem is essentially always true. Okay. <coughs> So let's have an example. Let f of x and y be uh, in the numerator 3 square root x y and then divide by y squared plus 1 and let the region R be given by um, 0 less or equal to x less or equal to 4 and 0 less or equal to y less or equal to 2 I want you to evaluate the double integral the double integral of f of x and y over r using Fubini's in both orders. So does anyone care to speculate what I could possibly mean by do it using Fubini's in both orders. What could I mean by that? Not that. Not that I want you to switch the order of the arguments to F. <coughs> Not that. So you got to remember what Fubini is. <coughs> Fubini is saying that this thing right here, the double integral to cut something into the French fry, into French fries, is the same as cutting it into bread slices. In both orders, well, this is what I mean. I mean these two. I want you to do first, uh, do it in this order, say y then x and then do it in the other order x uh, x and then y so that means do both do both iterated integrals okay so supposing we do that and supposing further that we do this one first if we do this one first and we get 10 what does that tell us about this one is going to need to be 10 also, right? Because they've got to be the same. They've got to be the same. Okay, well, let's see, let's see that, 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 that that works out. So which one do you want to do first, dx dy or dy dx? Okay. <coughs> for, no, for no specific reason other than that's what was first offered, dx dy. Uh, we're going to do that. So what are the limits on the outside? Zero to two. So from y is zero to y is two, and then by process of, process of elimination, the inside is x is zero to x is four, three square root x, y, over y squared plus 1 dx dy. Okay. Well, what do you think?
what should we do? I I agree. So we're going to we're going to have to do our work with respect to X. So is it clear what what the antiderivative of all that with respect to X is? For some of you it may be. I think that's great. But for some of you there's a lot of noise <laughs> in there. Well, let's think about it. So how about that three? That three is a pretty innocuous thing because we can all say, well, that's just a, it's just a three. It's a constant, right? We could factor it out. It, it really doesn't affect the antiderivative at all. It's just a three. But I claim that that is true for more than three. Why is that? So what, I, what I'm saying is this, to, so to, to be clear, I think I would get no hesitation, no objection, if I were to factor out the three and write, okay, like that, and then zero, four, and then square root x, <coughs> y over y squared plus one dx dy. So I factored the three out. But I claim we can do better. Mm -hmm. all, all the Y stuff can come out. This, this Y can come out. And so can that whole numerator, because that whole numerator is also constant with respect to X. So in fact, all, all of the stuff besides the X stuff comes out. So can you see that? In fact, you could factor out 3y over y squared plus 1. All of that can be factored out. And then 0 to 4 square root x dx dy. So now that we've done that, I, I hope suspect that it looks a lot simpler to you now. Okay, so then uh, do we know how to compute the antiderivative of square root x? So now, now we've got to get back into antiderivative mode. We've been in we've been in derivative mode for a while, so now we need to get back to antiderivative. So to remind you in the end, you really only know three antiderivatives. That's it. You know the power rule, you know the logarithm rule, and you know the exponential rule. <coughs> so which one is square root x? You got a you got a one-third chance of guessing. <laughs> exactly. So square root is, is radical exponent half, it, it is, is rational exponent half, and we can use the power rule. Okay. So this would be... Well, this 3 halves uh, is a constant, so it can be factored out uh, as well. The 3 halves came from 1 half plus 1. 1 half plus 1 is 
three halves. So this three halves can be factored out. So I factored it out, and I remembered that division by 3 halves is the same thing as multiplication by 2 thirds. So now we need to evaluate this thing here. <coughs> well, what is 4 to 3 halves? Eight. 4 to exponent 3 halves. Right? Because remember that the way fractional exponents work, uh, you look at this first as one half, exponent one half, and then as exponent three by factoring it. So the square root of four is two, and then two cubed is eight. Otherwise, you know, be, be able to do it with your calculator, I guess. So this would be integral from zero to two. I can see that these threes would cancel. So 2y or y squared plus 1 and then times 8 minus 0. Because 0 to 3 halves is 0. Okay, that's interesting. So 8 minus 0 is 8 times 2 is 16. So, integral 0 to 2, 16y over y squared plus 1 dy. Okay. So now we're at an integral that you could have done several weeks ago. So what are we supposed to do here? So you've got to remember the, the antiderivative procedure. In the end, there's just three that we know. The power rule, the logarithm rule, and the exponential rule. So is this exactly one of those three? It isn't. Is there something algebraic we could do to simplify it somehow? Not that I can see. So what's the next step in the antiderivative procedure? Can you do a substitution? Well, can you? Yeah, I think so. What, what do we need to say is u? y squared plus 1. So if u is y, <coughs> pardon me, if u is y squared plus 1, then du is 2y dy. So we could say du over 2 is y dy, which is good because we have a, d, we have a y dy. That's good. I'll go ahead and change the limits now. So u evaluated at 0 is 1. And u evaluated at 2 is 5. And to remind you, those of you that you've slept since the last time you did a substitution, saying that this red y stuff is being covered by this red u stuff. This green differential y stuff is being covered by this green differential u stuff. 
Uh, no, I circled the wrong one. My goodness. This one. Blah. And then <clears throat> the limits being covered by this. So hopefully this is all bringing back fond memories for you. So then the new integral is now 1 to 5, 16 over u, and then du over 2. Okay. So now we could do the 16 over 2. That's an 8 and factor that out. Supposing we've done that. I guess I'll just write it. Is this now exactly one of the three that we know? It is. It's the logarithm one. So this would be 8, natural log, absolute u, from 1 to 5. So that would be 8 and then multiplied by natural log of 5 minus natural log of 1. But what's the natural log of 1? 0. So then the answer is 8 times the log of 5. Okay. So have we answered the question? Have we answered the question? <coughs> Alternatively, what percentage are we through the question? Yeah, well, yeah, halfway. Halfway, right? Why are we halfway finished? Right. Yeah, because the instructions say, do it in both orders. So we're, ha we're halfway finished. So specifically, we just did dx dy, and in a moment we're going to do y dx. But I would say that we're probably in a better position now than we were before, because now we have an expectation about what we should get at the end of the next half. What should we get at the end of the next half? Eight times the natural log of five. We simply must get it. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you an exercise that's like this. Okay. I, I promise that, that there will be one. And if it comes to pass that you you do it in the one order and you do it in the uh, and you do it in the other order and you get two different answers, it is necessarily true that you have made at least one mistake. That means that you've gotten it right at most once, right? Maybe you got it wrong twice, right? Maybe, but you got it, you got it wrong at least once, okay? So let's do the, the, the next half. So now it was dy dx. And it's from x is 0 to x is 4, y is 0 to y is 2, 3 square root x, y over y squared plus 1, dy dx. Okay, so what do we need to do? Take out the constants. So you, you mean the y over y squared plus 1? No. 
No? Why not? That's what we did last time. Okay, good. So does everyone see that, yes, yes, we are still going to take the constants out. However, uh, so, so what I mean is, as the opening move, yes, we are going to take the constants out. However, because the situation is different, the x's are the constant things now. Okay. So 3 square root x can be factored out. Okay, so as for that, that integral that's, that's inside the square parentheses, how do we need to proceed? Substitution, right? Just like the last time. Except just to be different, I suppose, I'm going to call it W. So W is Y squared plus 1. So DW over 2 is Y DY. <coughs> w evaluated at 0 is 1. W evaluated at 2 is 5. get in there. 1 over w, dw over 2, yeah. Okay. So any question about making that substitution? <clears throat> so besides the half that we could factor out, just imagine that it to actually be factored out. Is this one of the three antiderivatives that we know? <coughs> so this, this W thing, is that one of the antiderivatives we know? Yeah, it's the, it's the natural log one. So this is x is 0 to 4 still, 3 square root x. And then this would be half natural log absolute value of w from 1 to 5 dx. OK, so plugging in. Plugging in those w values, again, we're going to get the log of 5 and the log of 1. But what's the log of 1? 0. So three squared x times half logarithm 5 dx. I think again we should factor out some constants. So what all is constant? Well, 3 is constant, so that can come out. Half and the logarithm of 5. Those are all constant. 
So three halves, logarithm of five, integral zero to four, square root x, dx. Here we are doing the square root of x again. <coughs> so three halves, log five, x to three halves, divide by three halves, from 0 to 4. We'll notice that this is multiply by 3 halves and this one is divide by 3 halves. So the multiply and divide cancel. So we get log 5 x to 3 halves and then this from 0 to 4 and that's 8. So is that what we expected? Yeah, that's what we expected. Okay. So any question about this example? So now we're going to do something, a, a variation on this theme. So far what we've been doing is we've been integrating um, over a rectangle. So all the pictures that we've drawn, all the pictures that we've drawn, We've been integrating over a rectangle. But now I want to say that, well, let's, can, can, can we imagine what would happen if we wanted to integrate over, say, a circle? Yeah, maybe we want to integrate over a, a circle shape or some other kind of shape, like a triangle. Anything but a rectangle. Okay, so how, how, would, we, how would we handle such a situation. <clears throat> so now, <clears throat> let f of x and y be given, and let the region R be given by a less or equal to x less or equal to b and now g of x is less or equal to y is less or equal to h of x so before we get any further I'd like to point out the distinction already and that is when we were talking about Fubini's theorem, these were constant. So constant, 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 constant. They're all constant, and that's what, that's what a rectangular shape looks like in the domain. And now notice that these are still constant. On the, on the new page that we're writing on. These are still constant, but these are now functions. Now this is not constant, it's a function of x, and that's a function of x. So what's happening is that in the, in the picture that we're dealing with, in the picture that we're dealing with, we still have this rectangle Two of the sides are still going to be straight, but now the other two sides are going to be wavy, possibly. So let's see what that means. <clears throat> so if we draw just in the xy plane, so 
x and y. If this is a and this is b, then it might be the case that g looks something like this. F looks something like that. Uh, no, not F, but H. So this region right here, this is R. That's region R. So what that has to do with our function is that when you when you draw the three-dimensional situation so here's z, x, and y so here is uh, a This is g of x. H of x. So now, instead of integrating over a rectangle down here, instead of this thing down here being a rectangle, now it's this other whatever shape okay, right there and now I guess I'll attempt to draw a surface above it strain myself to the limit so the front and back face are easy enough to draw because they're st still both against flat surfaces uh, but this one, <laughs> maybe like the I don't know, something like that. And then this one, like that. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment cutting this volume that we have drawn there into bread slices. And I'd like for you to observe that, so, so I'm going to make a requirement on the bread slices. You, ha you have to be, when you cut a bread slice, you, you, can't, you can't enter and then leave and then re-enter the bread. It has to be just, the knife has to pass right through it. And because of that, constraint only one of the only one of the bread slice techniques will work for this region only one of them so specifically only this one will work bread slices that are parallel to these because if you were to attempt to cut it this way like this at least when you're close to the green part you just for example right here you just cut that little bit right there well, that that I, that I'm saying is not legal but if you were to cut it this direction, it would always work. So bread slices this way always works. But not, not this way. For that reason, for that reason, that means that if you wanted to use an iterated integral, iterated integral, then only one of them would be available to you. You wouldn't have your choice, in a sense. You'd have to use specifically the right one. <clears throat> In such a case, the double integral over R 
of f of, f of x and y <coughs> dx dy, you just have the one iterated integral. So it would be from x is a to x is b, and it would be the outside integral, and then y is g of x, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> to y is h of x, f of x and y, dy, dx. Okay, and not the other iterated integral. So, <coughs> we'll get used to wh what this means, but for now, what I want you to observe, and this will be an important matter, is that we'll, have, we'll need to have the constants, the constant limits on the outside. So when the region you're integrating over is a rectangle, that means that the x's are between constants and the y's are also between constants, which, which is, uh, you know, you can kind of view that as one of the reasons why it doesn't matter if you do the one kind of bread slices or the other kind of bread slices because the x's are between constants and so are the y's. Let's do an example. So integral one to two, integral uh, y to y squared. x, y, dx, dy. Okay. So the first notable thing about this example is that the limits of the inside integral now have variables in them, right? Whereas before the previous examples, they were constants, but now, now we've got variables. However, still, notice that these are constant. Okay, they're still constant. So I'm about to write something, and it is going to be very much incorrect, wrong. So if you're going to copy what I'm about to write, you need to carefully note that it is wrong. Two example, uh, the, the last example that we worked on, we did, that was the one that we did it both ways. We did it uh, dx dy, then we did it dy dx. Okay, and it was first, it was first like this. Y is on the outside, x is on the inside, and then it was like that, the other way around. So you might kind of hope or think or wonder, well, could you do this? Could you, could you just, just do it like this? And the answer is no. <laughs> this thing that I just wrote makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's, a, it's a nonsense statement. In the same in the same kind of way that, you know, you, you could take you could take a, a typical sentence in English that, that that makes sense, grammatically correct, even eloquent. If you were to reorder a bunch of the words, it probably wouldn't make any sense. 
And that's the same kind of thing that's happening here. So this you can't do. The, the, thing, the thing that's screaming out that this is not okay, an o okay thing to do, at least for now, the thing that's screaming out to us is that this is not a constant, th that these limits are not constant. So, <clears throat> let's proceed with this one, which, which is fine. We can do this one. Okay, so that would be mm, the integral from y is 1 to y is 2, integral from x is y to x is y squared, xy dx y. So what's the antiderivative of xy with respect to x? So the y is just a constant. So what's the antiderivative of x? x squared over 2. Okay, now here's where one of the places where it's important to have good hygiene <laughs> about, about your notation is that otherwise you can start getting confused about what's getting plugged into what. So when we, when we do this part, we're going to replace the x's with expressions in y. Okay, so all the x's are going to be are going to become y. So for example, that x, the first thing we're going to do is replace, replace that x with a y squared. That's the first thing we're going to do. So so that x, we're replacing it with y squared. So y squared squared over 2 and then y. Uh, so I, I did that. And then minus, now, I guess I don't need this round parenthesis. Minus y squared over 2 y. So is there any question how that occurred? Well, how much y is all, all of that? <laughs> so y squared squared is how much? y to 4. And then we've got the one more y there. So that's y to 5. So this one would be y to 5 over 2, and then minus how much? y to 3 over 2 dy. And then this, uh, this is an integral that you could have done weeks ago. So I'll ignore the rest of the arithmetic, which you can reproduce uh, on your own. And when you do that, you get 27 over 8. Lovely. Any question about this 
uh, example. Okay. So uh, let f of x and y be x plus 2y, and let r be the region uh, that is bounded by the bounded region, which is bounded by it's a little clumsy to say, isn't it? Y is um, 2x and y is x squared. So that's the, the setup. I want you to evaluate the double integral over r of f of x and y dx dy. Okay, well. So for this question, this is the, the in, in, in a sense, the least information I've given you on how to proceed. So notably, notably, um, I haven't given you any x limits. For example, I haven't said say, I haven't uh, I, not explicitly anyway. I haven't explicitly given you any x limits. I didn't say between x is uh, three and ten, for example. So if you're going to do this you're going to have to figure out what region it is that we're talking about. So how can you figure out what, what region are we talking about? Mm -hmm. What kind of thing is this if you were to plot it? A line. So it would look something like this. It's a line. And what kind of thing is this? Parabola. So the question we need to address <clears throat> uh, in the first place, so I'll say evaluate this, I'll say that, that that really is question two. I'll say question one is I want you to sketch, I want you to sketch the region, sketch. Okay, so in order, in order to do either one of those, the, the first question is how, how do the line and the parabola intersect? And then how do we end up addressing that question? How do you determine the intersections of two plots? Mm -hmm. We need to solve the equation line equal parabola. We have to solve this equation, which is to say we need to solve 2x equal x squared. 
If we solve this, this will answer where they intersect. So 0 is x squared minus 2x. So 0 is x times x minus 2. So the solutions are 0 and 2. Any question about how, how we did that just then? Okay, so uh, that means that if, when, we, when we sketch this, we go from 0 to 2, and then I'll plot the line. So for the line, when x is 0, what is y? Also 0. And then when x is 2, what is y? 4. So the line looks like this. Of course, those, those, the, that uh, 0, 0, and 2, 4 are also on the parabola. How does the parabola look between 0 and 2? Well, something like that, right? Okay. So the region in question, the bounded region bounded by blah, blah, by those two, is this. So, how do we translate this into um, the limits of integration for an iterated integral? That is to say, we'd like to have something like this, something that looks like x is between something, y is between something, and what I want from you is I want you to tell me what goes in these boxes. tell me what goes in those four blue boxes and it must be the case furthermore that either the x limits are constant or the y limits are constant e either these are constant or those are constant so how can we fill in those boxes Or alternatively, will the x things be constant or will the y things be constant? Zero and two. <coughs> well, we, we definitely need to replace them with the functions because if you were to select an x between zero and two, say like say this one. So that's a particular value only part of it is going through the region in question. So down here, 
right? They're, we're not in the region, you know, this, this porridge is too cold, and, and then up here, we're not in the region either, because this porridge is too hot. It's only, it's only in here where we're in the region. So what goes right here? x squared, and then 2x, which is to say, from the parabola to the line going up, from the parabola to the line, parabola, line. Okay, any question about this? So, so what is the, this being the case, what is the correct order of integration? Or, if you like, which one's got to be on the outside? Zero to two's got to be on the outside. So the x's, the x's have got to be outside. So as a result, it must be from zero to two, and then from x squared to two x, and then that thing, x plus two y, dy, dx. Okay. So, because we've done a few of these already, because we've done a few of these already, uh, I'll just say, ah, this one's boring. So you, <laughs> from here it's boring. You could say, oh, well, dot, dot, dot. Somehow you would finish this in the same way that we've done so many before, uh, and you would get 28 over 5. Okay, so verify, verify that from here, you can, you can make it to 28 over 5. Okay, so now I want to leave you with a, a, a brain teaser, something to think about over the weekend. Okay. So here's, a, here's a, an integral, iterated integral. 0 to 16, square root y to 4, and then what we're integrating is x cubed plus 4 uh, dx dy. So in particular, we've got to deal with the x's first, according to the way it's written. So we can even ignore for the moment the limits and just look at that antiderivative right there. Is that an antiderivative that you know how to do? Could you use a substitution? <coughs> nah, because if you said that u was, say, the stuff in the radical, if you said that u was x cubed plus 4, then you'd need a 3x squared somewhere. Is there a 3x squared or any kind of x squared anywhere to be had? There isn't. So a substitution wouldn't work. It, it might be possible to do a very tedious, <laughs> an extremely tedious use of integration by parts, but you'd have to do it more than once. And I'm not, and I'm not, I'm having difficulty seeing it all the way to the end. I'm not sure that you'd be able to do it. <laughs> so how, so how could we go about solving this? The answer is that we're going to do the following. That we're going to consider that what this is saying, what this is saying 
is that would be equivalent to the region uh, 0 less or equal to y less or equal to 16 and square root y less or equal to x less or equal to 4 that region and then if you plot this region So between y is 0 and y is 16, uh, so y is 16, x is 4, And now my question to you is, what does x is the square root of y look like? If you were to plot it, x is square root y. If you're having difficulty, it's because you're just accustomed to having y solved for. So could you solve for y? If you square both sides, that's a parabola, half of a parabola. And it looks like this. So the region being talked about is this. That's the region R. But you could, you could reinterpret this in dy dx and proceed. That is to say, how do you spell proceed? Wow, is it ee -E or is it ede? -E? Oh, two e's like that? And proceed. I gave you the iterated integral in that order, dx dy. But it's actually not possible to do this in this order. So the way that you'll, that we'll accomplish it on Tuesday is we'll say, well, let's reconsider this region, do it in the other order, and then proceed. So see if you can finish, take this one to conclusion over the weekend. So have a nice weekend.